I can't remember when I first met Reginald Marsh, but it must have been in the early 1950s when I was attending the Arts Students League of New York. I was in his class for a short time. Around the same time, I rented a studio in 1 Union Square West on the floor beneath Marsh's attic studio. When I heard his door slam for his lunch break, I would step out to get the elevator and have a chance to accompany him on his walk to his apartment on the other side of Union Square Park. I was his studio neighbor for two years. When Marsh died on a July 4th weekend in 1954, I was suggested by a mutual friend, Mary Fife Lanning, to help his widow, Marsh's art. Mrs. Marsh's lawyer, Joseph Walker, interviewed me in his downtown office and hired me for several hours a week to curate Marsh's work. At the time of his death, his wife did not have the means to care for her husband's work. Marsh's friend from Yale, William Benton, purchased a half interest in Marsh's art. I worked for both of them. I did this for 25 years and continued to serve as the expert on Marsh's art based on my cataloging most of his estate and authoring a definitive study of his prints. I assisted Lloyd Goodrich in the Marsh retrospective at the Whitney Museum and arranged and assisted in many other publications and exhibits. Since I had little formal higher education and no serious art history study, I was guarded by Marsh's lifelong friend, Lloyd Goodrich, who was to become the director of the Whitney Museum of American Art. Marsh started out as an illustrator, which he also did when he attended Yale and created art for student publications. After graduation, he did illustrations for the Daily News and the New Yorker magazine, and he started doing watercolor studies of various New York City subjects. These were descriptive studies. In the 30s, he started to make paintings, first in oils, and then abandoned it for the more comfortable, suitable medium, egg tempera, which he used in a unique way. He did this for the rest of his life, continually experimenting with various combinations of paints, mediums, oils, and varnishes. He still made on-the-spot watercolor studies. The rest of his work was more distinctively marshes studio paintings based on drawings, studies, photographs, and other visual resources, which he had learned to use as an illustrator. Marsh would stop in to visit my studio. At the time of his death in 1954, I was working on two paintings heavily influenced by Marsh's work, The Queen and Strolling Away, both illustrated here. He was interested in how I used egg tempera. My use was more in line with the historical, as described by the Italian Benvenuto Cellini and modern commentators on that technique. He placed a few strokes on the painting to see how the mixture felt. He used a heavily diluted tempera. My use was more opaque. Marsh married Betty Burroughs, the daughter of the Metropolitan Museum of Art's curator of paintings. They divorced in the early 30s, and he married Felicia Meyer shortly thereafter. Marsh was always attracted to the theater and the burlesque. His work for the Daily News entailed reading the performers graphically. The burlesque Coney Island Beach, the subway, the dance halls appealed to his visual sensibility. Often, the mystery and attractiveness of women played a central role. The men not always, except for bodybuilders at the beach. Many of the other men were crushed, down and out, or members of the audience paying to see. Marsh was a round-faced, short and stocky man. 
He died young at 56 and left no children. He was part of society, but not, I think, entirely comfortable. It was a great pleasure for me to be able to know him toward the end of his life and to be able to care for his work beyond that.